Welcome to the Alliance for Democracy. Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This is our half half hour weekly cable access interview program uh, from a, a democracy, democratic, progressive per perspective. Um, the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination and create true democracy. So our guest today is Dan Sears, who is the conservation director of Columbia Riverkeeper. So welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah. So we want to talk about uh, coal and fossil fuels and oil and so forth. That is, um, you have projects here in the Pacific Northwest. So um, that's right. We are ground zero for uh, major coal, oil, and gas proposals that would really transform our region into a major exporter of fossil fuels, but also a major consumer of fossil fuels. Okay, yeah, so, so uh, t talk about, talk about well, just where we stand with this fossil fuel industry push uh, yeah. that has gotten us to this point. You know, for the last decade, Oregonians and Washingtonians have been pushing back on proposals to use the Northwest as a gateway, essentially to either move in or move out very large amounts of coal, oil, and gas. Um, and so right now we stand as, we stand at a place where we've had some success in stopping some of the largest proposals. Um, after a 12 year fight, we stopped liquefied natural gas export on the Columbia River. LNG. LNG, yeah, which uh, I think I was looking up, you and I did a show mm -hmm. in 2011 about mm -hmm. LNG uh, together. And then um, coal exports, uh, there were proposals for over 100 million tons of coal exports uh, coming down the Columbia River, being loaded onto ships, and being shipped out. Uh, we stopped all but one major proposal in Longview, which would be 44 million tons yeah, so of coal. So power to the people. Yes, and we're very power close to people. stopping the one in Longview. Mm -hmm. And then for oil, we're down to really one major mega proposal in Vancouver, Washington, right across the river from us uh, that would export oil. So 2016 was characterized, by, I think, by a lot of success and ratcheting back these proposals. 2017 is sort of leaving us with the really big proposals, which are the huge coal export terminal in Longview, um, I call them the big three, and the huge oil by rail terminal in Vancouver, and then sandwiched in between are, uh, or is a proposal in Kalama, Washington that would turn natural gas or fracked gas into me methanol and export that methanol overseas. Uh, that proposal is being backed by the Chinese government. Um, it's very large, would be the largest of its kind in the world. Um, and it would use about a third of the gas in the entire state of Washington. So it's a, a mega gas proposal sandwiched in between an oil and coal behemoth. Yeah, so you said a third of the gas in Washington, that is a third of the gas that comes into Washington? Washington yeah. doesn't manufacture any gas itself, does it? That's a great point, yes. Yeah. So this would be gas that would be uh, coming at least in part or largely from fracking. Um, a lot of the gas we get in the Northwest comes from shale fields, and so it's fracked out of the ground. Um, so that gas comes in via pipeline, um, and it would be turned from methane gas, which is the main component of natural gas, into methanol for export. So right now we're in this really interesting spot where we are, um, you know, we're fighting big oil, big coal, and right in between this growing battle over fracked natural gas infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So for those who are not uh, from this area, Longview is what, 50 miles north of Portland on the Columbia yeah, River? Is that roughly, right? okay. yeah, roughly, and, yeah. And Longview is uh, an industrial town, um, has a lot of history with the timber industry, and used to have a big aluminum facility, and that former aluminum facility is what's being targeted for a very large coal export terminal. So in 2016, we saw the Lummi Nation and Cherry Point, Washington have an enormous impact on our entire region when they successfully defeated a coal export terminal that would have been even larger. And that, that's north of Seattle. That's way, right. yeah, okay. way up by the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. And so their victory um, really benefited the entire region and left us just with this one huge proposal in Longview, which would be 44 million tons of coal per year. Now, to put that in context, our only coal-fired power plant in Oregon burns, you know, roughly three million tons of coal per year. Okay. And so we're talking cool. about 10 or more boardmen's worth of coal uh, being shipped out. Um, the issue is really very live for people who live in Cowlitz County. They're very concerned about the 16 trains a day that would have to come in um, or, and leave. So eight in, eight out 
every day uh, crossing all the main waterfront intersections in Longview. Um, that's a big impact on the community. Um, ultimately, it would be a big public expense to try to fix those intersections to make them suitable for coal export. Um, and then at sort of a more fundamental level, the state of Washington is trying to decide whether becoming this huge trafficker of toxic and dirty coal is consistent with its goals for curbing the impacts of, uh, of climate change and at least being a participant in trying to ratchet back our contribution uh, to climate polluting fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So that's where things stand with the coal export terminal. Um, it, as a physical proposal, it's actually been dealt a very severe blow in just the last several weeks when um, the Department of Natural Resources denied a key lease, a, um, a sublease essentially. It's like having, it's like applying for the right to use an apartment and not passing the credit check. That's okay. essentially what happened to the coal developer where the Department of Natural Resources said uh, that the coal developer should not have the right, um, did not pass the test essentially to use the state-owned lands of Washington uh, to uh, export this massive quantity of coal. Um, the developer Millennium Coal is challenging the Department of Natural Resources, um, even though initially they said, oh, we don't need that permission from the state. Oh, oh. So the coal export terminal in Longview is facing steep odds, but very big decisions are still to come. The state of Washington will issue a final environmental impact statement and then make a decision about whether the project complies with the Clean Water Act. All of that's happening in 2017. So um, of, of the big three, we could definitely see a decision on the coal terminal in 2017. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So just jumping to what I usually do at the end, uh, which is my usual question, I'll do it now. On this specific project, how can people interact with you or, or voice opposition yeah, Jasmine Zimmerstucky is our lead organizer who's been working in Cowlitz County on two of these projects, both the coal export terminal and the, the methanol refinery, uh, which we're dealing with both, and they're very close to each other. Um, she is, uh, you can connect with us through our website, and we're going to be weighing in with the Department of Ecology, urging them to deny these key uh, permits for the coal facility here in 2017. So when that final environmental impact statement comes out in late April, and you know, soon thereafter, we could see a decision uh, that will kind of signal whether the state of Washington is willing to continue entertaining this crazy mega proposal for coal exports. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And and uh, we have your web address up on the screen under your name, so people can find it there. So uh, great. And, and uh, so uh, that's one project. Yeah. Talk about the methanol project. So this is where things also get really interesting. You know. uh, let, let, let me, what, one other thing I just wanted to point yeah. out, those 16 trains of coal that would be going into Kalama will be coming through the Columbia Gorge. That's right. And so uh, beautiful, scenic, uh, iconic um, area for the Northwest with the river right there, uh, a very major river uh, for, yeah. for the North American continent. It's a, it's we're at this time when the fossil fuel industry is looking at the Pacific Northwest because the Columbia River Gorge provides this narrow chute through the mountain ranges and it provides the shortest path from this huge quantity of fossil fuel supplies and a big market or big markets in Asia in China South Korea that would love to you know, burn this stuff and so we're the path in between mm -hmm. and we are at this choke point in the entire region and so what we do as activists, what we do is, you know, people who are influencing our legislators and our governors and our agencies has a disproportionate impact on the future of the climate. Um, we are in a really important place and a really important time. And that's why I'm really heartened to see so many people from around the region. You know, the reason we're, we were able to get uh, this far without a major fossil fuel project being approved is because of citizen activism. It's because people have been attending hearings in record numbers, submitting enormous numbers of comments, written comments, holding rallies, holding demonstrations, um, you know, educating their neighbors, you know, getting people to go out and walk near the tracks that would be used for dangerous oil trains or dusty coal trains. Um, that's that activism has been going on for years now, and people. I think are looking and really focusing in now on this stretch of river with these big three proposals um, and seeing that we're a 
we can shut the door in 2016, 2017, and 2018, and this multi-year period here, this is a de is decision time. Great, okay, good. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. You were starting to talk about the methanol plant. So I'll talk about natural gas more broadly, which mm -hmm. is um, often gets, gets away with painting itself as a cleaner fossil fuel. And so in the Northwest, we are seeing a big push on really two fronts to hook the region on more natural gas or cl a clever branding, natural gas. It's, we like to call it methane gas or fracked gas because there's really nothing all that natural about forcing, forcing methane gas out of the ground with injected chemicals yeah. mm -hmm. and piping it across the continent. But here we are, and in Colombo, Washington, and a second proposal near Klatskanai, Oregon, uh, they would take fracked gas and turn it into methanol, which would be used to ultimately manufacture plastic in China. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the purpose of the Kalama Methanol Refinery, which is sort of charging ahead right now and trying to get approvals from the state of Washington. It's received um, favorable decisions so far from Cowlitz County, um, a local county that uh, for years has been open to coal and oil and gas development. Um, but the state of Washington has yet to fully vet this project. And th that's where we see a real problem with um, the Kalamba proposal would involve using 320 million cubic feet of gas a day. That's just a staggering amount of gas. The proposal in Oregon would use about the same amount of gas right across the river. You put these two together. What's the name of the one across the river in Oregon? Port Westward is Port where Westward. it would be located. Okay. Okay. But it's the same company oh, uh, oh. called Northwest Innovation Works. They're a subsidiary of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Oh. And so um, there are big players involved with trying to, I think, dupe this area, this region, into building methanol refineries that will ultimately require a major upgrade, a major expansion of pipelines in the Pacific Northwest to feed them. And so what they're doing is a classic tactic of piecemealing the project, pretending as if the terminal is unrelated to the pipelines that would have to feed it. <laughs> and this is a real failing um, of the overall review so far, is that they've gotten away with this. And so it could be that a proposal um, would be necessary to build a pipeline over the Mount Hood Forest or down the I-5 corridor from Canada to feed these methanol refineries on the Columbia River. We know for a fact that they simply cannot exist, these two refineries, with the pipeline infrastructure that's currently in place. It's just too much gas would be demanded. We're talking about, if you put them together, more gas than we use in the entire state of Oregon uh, in just this little region between Port Westward and Kalama, Washington. Mm. So it's a game changer for the region. It would require replumbing the infrastructure of for fracked gas. And from our perspective, they would be sort of the anchor tenants on a new pipeline infrastructure that could then be used for new natural gas fired power plants. Um, now far from this, on the other side of the Cascades, um, near an existing pipeline, um, in Boardman, Oregon, we are dealing with kind of the other lobe of the fracked gas nightmare that the Northwest is entering into, which is uh, PGE's plan to hook Portland on decades of fracked gas power. And they want to turn the Boardman coal-fired power plant, which is about 500 megawatts, into over 1,300 megawatts of natural gas or fracked gas powered electricity. So just, just history recently, uh, the state of Oregon required PGE, Portland General Electric, that owns Boardman, to convert f or to shut down uh, the use of coal in that plant. And so PGE wants to now convert it to, to a methanol. To natural gas. Uh, natural gas, I'm sorry, yeah, natural gas. That's right. But, okay. um, and so there, these are really two separate and unrelated issues. You know, the methanol refineries in the estuary would be these big monster proposals that would soak up a lot of fracked gas, but almost uh, <laughs> equally as offensive to Oregonians who've been fighting for clean energy and for being responsible um, users of energy and trying to deal with the climate crisis would be this proposal out in Boardman that would hook up Portland customers. Um, the City Council of Portland just voted that they didn't want any more fossil fuel infrastructure, major infrastructure in the city of Portland mm -hmm. to be expanded and built out. And yet PGE is trying to hook Portland by wire to this huge, huge fracked gas proposal out in Boardman. So that stands at a very important crossroads right now. Um, you know, the 
PGE is asking the Oregon Utilities Commission, the Public Utilities Commission, to approve um, ratepayers uh, paying for these gas plants. PGE is asking Oregon's Energy Facility Siting Council to approve amending its existing site certifi certificate in Boardman to allow these new gas plants to go in. And PGE is asking DEQ to allow um, these facilities to pollute at very high levels. In fact, PGE's already built one of these facilities and it's polluting at much higher levels than they expected for volatile organic compounds, which is a smog forming pollutant in the air. Uh, the gorge already has a problem with regional haze. Um, it's well known to people who live in the Columbia River Gorge mm -hmm. um, and further down. And you know, so there are big decision points in 2017. And for people who want to get engaged with this, there's uh, a campaign that's ramping up um, this spring to call on PGE, one, to back out of this, and then to call on all these agencies to turn PGE away from this fracked gas future that they're trying to, they're trying to impose here on customers um, okay. in the Portland area. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you are uh, knowledgeable about this, I'll ask you. Uh, PGE also has, or is that looking at some proposal for using biogas or biomass at, yeah. at Boardman plant also, you comment on that? Yeah, I think for most folks who've looked at that, they don't think it's likely to move forward in a big way, uh, but they've, just because the, the amounts of material that would be required to you know, repower the existing coal-fired power plant with biomass would be challenging to accomplish. Um, and so what I've seen initially, at least from um, the folks who are taking a close look at it, it doesn't seem like that proposal is going to come forward oh. soon to actually repower the coal-fired power plant mm -hmm. with biomass. But it's something that people should be watching throughout the region. Um, mm -hmm. and has big implications for not just the power plant, but forest management. Um, if that were to be used as a supply. Yeah, so yeah. And, and the report that I read, which was from Sierra Club, talked about this uh, grass, and I don't remember what the name of it is, that they would have to plant yeah. tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of acres in order to, to uh, fuel the plant. They've looked at all kinds of different options um, about, you know, torrified biomass and the, the grass you're talking about, and then, you know, waste wood or uh, thinning projects on the east side, all of that coming in. Um, I think the the nearer term push from PGE is going to be for the fracked gas proposals okay. at Boardman. Mm -hmm. So that's the one where I think a lot of people are focused right now. We think that's more of a threat, to be honest, for, mm -hmm. for happening soon, for them to start getting approvals. Um, but it's a really interesting time for PGE to be asking for this expanded footprint at Boardman when they're having problems with their existing Unit one, mm -hmm. uh, they've already essentially replaced Boardman with natural gas. What they're asking for is to doubly replace Boardman uh, with natural gas, uh, which is no matter how you do the the math, um, a net loss for the climate. And I think this is one of the points that I, I really want to make about all of these natural gas projects. You know, the the new natural gas fired power plants, which won't only be in Boardman, but could also come west of the Cascades, uh, particularly in Washington. Um, and these methanol refineries, they r rely on a fuel that um, often is considered to be cleaner than coal, but really isn't. Um, what you see when you look more closely at the track record of the natural gas industry is that they release an enormous amount of methane during the production and transmission of natural gas. When they do that, um, methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so, you know, there's this really I think powerful graph from uh, Bob Horth at Cornell that shows uh, these two bars, and one of them shows um, natural gas, one of them coal, and the red piece of that bar is the contribution of methane um, to the overall greenhouse gas impact of these two fuels. Mm -hmm. Now, Horth was criticized for maybe painting natural gas in too unfavorable a uh, light. Um, and what subsequent studies have shown is not all coal was created the same and not all natural gas is created the same, but these two fuels overlap significantly in their overall greenhouse gas impact. And so switching from one to another is not guaranteed to be any benefit to the mm -hmm. climate. This is the time when, you know, Portlanders at least have spoken that we want to begin a managed decline of fossil fuel use. The city council voted unanimously to steer Portland away from dramatic 
new expansions of fossil fuel infrastructure, and yet Portland General Electric is seeking this decades-long commitment, uh, this ratepayer commitment, ultimately, to buying more fracked gas, mm -hmm. even though we know it's not a significant improvement um, over coal on a per unit basis, and certainly building 1,300 megawatts of it is a step backwards. <laughs> yeah. you know, mm -hmm. No matter what you think of natural gas, mm -hmm. 1,300 megawatts of natural gas out of Boardman is uh, is going to be a real problem for meeting the state's climate goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We um, need to talk a little bit about, about Vancouver. What's happening in Vancouver? Yeah. And so the third of the big three, um, closest to home here in Portland, is the Vancouver Oil Terminal. Tesoro and Savage Companies. Uh, Tesoro is a big oil company. Savage is an oil logistics and handling company. Um, they are seeking to build a 360,000 barrel a day oil terminal in Vancouver. Uh, I think. A lot of your uh, viewers will be familiar with what happened in Mosier in June of 2016, where an oil train, <laughs> yeah, coming down the Columbia River Gorge, derailed, spilled, ignited, and caused a fire that took hours and hours to put out. Uh, we were extremely lucky that the train didn't derail immediately into the river, uh, and that it was a windless day in the Columbia River Gorge, which is unbelievably unheard of. You know, in June to have a, essentially a wind-free day. Um, that event, I think, has really regalvanized the opposition to this enormous oil by rail terminal proposed in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, so the city of Vancouver opposes the project. The Washington Attorney General opposes the project. The city of Spokane opposes the project. The Columbia River Treaty Tribes have been vocal and engaged in opposing the project. There's a huge coalition called Stand Up to Oil, which is opposing the project. Um, and there's a, a series of decisions happening in the next several months that will shape uh, whether or not uh, Washington continues to allow this really crazy idea to, you know, essentially hold space at the Port of Vancouver. Um, so the decision can be made at the port level, where the Port of Vancouver really at any time can pull the plug and exit its lease agreement with Tesoro. Um, or it can happen. That, that, that would be the end of the project? Essentially that would be the end of the project. Oh, okay. um, the Port of Vancouver is really on an island. Uh, they are one of the few backers of this project. Um, other economic entities and the the Vancouver area, including the city of Vancouver and Vancouver's new waterfront development project, they oppose the project. They see it as a conflict with Vancouver's future growth, um, as do a big coalition of small businesses called Vancouver 101. There's actually more than 101 now. There's quite a few more. Uh, but there's this sort of outcry from Vancouver that you know, they want the type of development that is going to connect people with the Columbia River, not separate them from it with dangerous oil trains. Uh, yeah, because they, as, I, as I've looked at the map of where that would go, uh, Vancouver is trying to develop the waterfront area. That's they right. have some really nice plans for it, uh, which are directly south of the site. Yeah. And uh, I c can't imagine that those developers are, would be happy about this. And, you know, I think everyone has become far more skeptical of the proposal after seeing oil train after oil train derail and explode and burn. Um, Lac Magantique in Quebec was the first major one in 2013 where a, a derailed train killed 47 people and caused enormous environmental damage. Uh, Mosier was the latest um, he, right here in Oregon where we saw a train derail spectacularly and, and nearly, you know, if it had been a windy day, we really could have lost the town of Mosier. They had to evacuate the Mosier Community School right mm -hmm. there. Um, close by. Um, it's, it's an experiment that has been tried and failed. The idea of moving large quantities of oil in fast moving trains with cars that puncture and erupt, it's, it's, a, it's insane at this point. Insane is the word that the Mosier fire chief used to describe this method of moving very volatile crude oil from North Dakota. Um, so we're at a time where the ultimate decision maker, you know, if the port doesn't say no, if Washington's Energy Facility Citing Evaluation Council uh, makes, you know, an unclear recommendation, um, ultimately Governor Inslee will be the decision maker. And he is well aware of the risks that oil trains pose now, particularly in the wake of the Mosier derailment. And so all eyes will be turning to Governor Inslee ultimately in 2017 to make this call if, you know, the people leading up to him aren't willing to do it, if the Port of Vancouver isn't willing to pull the plug, or um, the Energy Facility Siting Evaluation Council, ideally they will make a negative recommendation to Governor Inslee, but ultimately it's going to be his call. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, so when is the Port of Portland, or excuse me, Port of Vancouver expected to make a decision? 
Um, they will have a vote on March 7th, um, oh. and so that's one potential decision point. Um, so at least it's on the agenda for March uh, 7th. Oh, okay, so we'll, by meeting. the time this program re that's right. uh, broad, uh, uh, yeah, is broadcast, we'll already know what, what that decision Check is. Check ColumbiaRiverKeeper.org. You know, by the time you're watching this, you know, our viewers, they, we might have already won this fight if the mm -hmm. Port of Vancouver yeah. has done the right thing. Mm -hmm. And the table is set for them to pull the plug. I mean, they, they have the local longshore union saying, we would love to have jobs at this site, but we do not want to work in a loop you know, surrounded by dangerous oil trains. I, I think that's really phenomenal that they, yeah. that they have taken that position because we usually expect uh, uh, trade unions to always support job creation. And, and in I this think case, they're saying no. And I think there's a recognition that this doesn't create that many jobs, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, plugging in oil cars to pipes and tanks isn't that big a job creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this for exporting the oil, or is it going to be used in the Northwest? It could be exported. And so one of the big decisions that the Siting Evaluation Council in Washington has to make is whether there's this uh, preponderance of benefit to the state of Washington versus the risks, the enormous environmental risks. So the risk side of the equation is pretty well established. You could have an oil train derailing and exploding in Vancouver, causing you know five to six billion dollars in damage. Like that's the real mm -hmm. um, risk that's imposed on the community. On the other side is where does this oil go? And the state of Washington already refines and produces more oil than it consumes. Um, that's, that's where we stand right now. And Congress lifted the oil export ban in 2015. And so we know that there's the potential for this oil to go anywhere in the world. Okay. So we, we truly would become the export capital of, of, of the West Coast, certainly. Um, we remain uh, the target for um, exporting globally significant quantities of coal, oil, and fracked gas. Mm -hmm. And until we can slam the door on these proposals, we're going to need everyone uh, watching this show to continue to be engaged and to put pressure on our elected leaders in Washington and Oregon. Okay, great. Thank you very much for being here, Dan. Thank you, David. All right, great. So we've been talking with Dan Sears, Conservation Director of uh, the Columbia Riverkeeper. Uh, and so uh, go to the website and uh, check in with them and see what's going on and how you can be involved with stopping these various plans. So thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week. Bye.